Archaeology is the search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're looking for, Mr. Tenney's philosophy class is right down the hall. So forget any ideas you got about lost cities and exotic travel and digging up the world. We do not follow maps to bury treasure, and X never, ever marks the spot. 70% of all archaeology happens in the library. Reading. Research. We cannot afford to take mythology at face value. Forget about that guy. The quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. If it's captured by the Nazis, the armies of darkness will march all over the face of the earth. Do you understand me? Today, we're talking about Indiana Jones. Yeah! Welcome to Pop Culture Catechism. Conversations about music, movies, and the longings of the human heart. Let's get started. Do you want to go on an adventure? Now, why are we so fascinated by ancient cultures and ancient beliefs and their practices? What if my childhood was less than perfect? Can going on some adventures and finding some ancient wisdom help heal some of those wounds? Or am I just trying to fill a bottomless pit of hurt with thrills and head candy? Today, we are talking about Indiana Jones on Pop Culture Catechism, and we are happy to be joined by Mark Hart, who is the CIO of Life Teen International and The Bible Geek. My name is Mike Tenney. I am a Catholic speaker and worship leader out of Washington, D.C. I spent over a decade teaching Catholic high school theology during the day and trying to make it big as a rock star at night. And now I'm blessed to speak and lead music with thousands of people each year at events across the country and also through this show, Pop Culture Catechism. And uh, I love talking about pop culture and the music and the movies that matter to us and asking why do they matter to us so much. So this is Pop Culture Catechism, the gospel according to pop music and movies, where we look for God's love and the media that you're plugged into. So then when you're done with the show and you unplug and take your earbuds out and get back to your real life, we can have a little bit more of the gospel in our hearts and we can know God's love and love the people in our lives a little bit better. So that's my goal for us by the end of this episode. Not only will we have a deeper appreciation of Indiana Jones, but we'll be able to take a few more steps in our gospel walk and journey. A special thank you to our patrons who make this show possible through popculturecatechism.com and the Awaken app. I am very happy to welcome to the show, Mark Hart. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me. Great. I'm so glad to have you here. It's, it's taken us a while to, to make this happen. We've been trying to make this happen for a while, but, uh, but I really appreciate you. You're a busy guy, and I appreciate you taking some time to, to, oh. to be here. Oh, we're all busy. We're all busy. If God is God is timeless. We are not. That's problem. So. Yeah. So I, I I know what Life Teen is, and I know I know what you do, and I, I know about your ministry as the Bible geek. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm in youth ministry now. I'm in my 27th year, my 25th year with Life Teen. Um, so Life Teen exists to help parishes uh, just do better, to help priests, youth ministers, whether they're paid or volunteer, core members. Um, just do an even better job at translating the gospel, which is really what you guys do, right? Yeah. Um, um, this, that's the whole reason for this, is how do we take the timelessness of God's truth, but translate it and transmit it in a timely way that makes sense in the 21st century, you know, for those of us, and not just teenagers, all of us who have an attention span of what, 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 like for four seconds, you know? Um, so that's what we do. So we, we, we host, we have summer camps and we have training conferences and resources and things just to help parishes reach out to middle schoolers and high schoolers, uh, young adults, just to help them do a better job. And um, I, uh, I, I love what I do. I get, to, uh, I get to write, I get to produce, I get to speak, I get to serve, I get to train. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, right, right now, honestly, like I, I have a college student, a high school student, a middle school student, an elementary school student. I mean, like I, I'm all about trying to translate the gospel. So I'll use anything and everything, every TV show, any movie, any song. That's why I'm so excited to be here. I'm such a fan of this whole idea because you can find God anywhere. You just have to know how to look and where to look. Amen. Amen. Uh, I was just one of the guys I follow on, on Instagram. I forget his name and exactly what he says, but it was a cool idea. He said, you know, I'm less concerned about uh, Christian art in the sense of, is it made by a Christian, but as a Christian viewing art, where, where can I find God in it? And I just, mm -hmm. I, I, if, you know, God is, God is in everything. God made everything and everything we see that is good, true and beautiful. Like we can, um, there's something of God in it that, that speaks to us. So we can kind of, mm -hmm. a lot of times we can kind of uncrumple that thing. So I was excited to have you here. Cause I was, uh, in my youth group in high school where I first really feel like I, I met Jesus and started riding the Jesus train and drinking the Jesus juice and being all in for Christ. Like that, that happened at a, we, it was my, our life team group at our, at our church. And as, as a campus minister and youth minister for high school students for many years, I did a lot of life team programs and a lot of life team retreats. Um, 
and learning a lot of music for life team trainings and that sort of thing. And just, I, I love the spirit of the people. I love the heart of the mission. Um, and so it was something that struck me when you said you wanted to talk about Indiana Jones and rewatching the movies. It was kind of fun to go back through and watch all these movies again. It is. And one of the things that struck me is the young people in Mm -hmm. these and so i was like this may, this is a perfect show to talk to mark about and then all the bible stuff and you know in your speaking mm -hmm. ministry you go by the bible geek and you, you put scripture through so much of your speaking which i really appreciate because a lot of times i'll hear speakers and they're, you know it's just kind of like well what you said is good but like where's where's the scripture you know um I, so, where's the jesus yeah where's the jesus so i really appreciate that so i'm, I'm really excited to, to hear what yeah. you have to say about this so um before we get into it, if you Indiana Jones is a little bit older, so maybe uh, if mm -hmm. you didn't grow up watching them like I did, listeners, um, there is a fifth movie coming out. It was supposed to come out summer 2022, mm -hmm. but it just got pushed back like last week to summer 2023. So we're going to have to wait a whole year for Indiana Jones 5. But the core trilogy uh, was uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom in 1984, which was actually a prequel, and then Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. My personal favorite, I think it's the best, it's got Sean Connery in it, and uh, that's 1989. And then there was Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which um, <sighs> was was not as bad on my second watching uh, this this past yeah. time as I remember. That was in 2008, um, but still, it's it's it doesn't measure up to the first three. Um, and then no. there was actually uh, from 92 to 94, there was a Young Indiana Jones Chronicles TV show, which I never mm -hmm. watched. Did you ever watch those? I caught a bits and pieces of it here and there. Yeah, yeah it anyway, wasn't, so, I wasn't so a regular viewer. We probably won't uh, talk about that, but we'll be talking about so a, lo a lot about the first three movies. We'll probably touch on Crystal mm -hmm. Skull some. Uh, anyway, so if you're looking for the fifth movie, as of right now, they're saying it'll be out June 30th, 2023. Uh, filming already wrapped up in February 22. This was a brainchild of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. They kind of wanted to take Harrison Ford and make kind of an American James Bond. They said it was going to be James mm -hmm. Bond without all the gadgets, you know, just kind of right. a, a gruff sort of James Bond. So anyway, what do you love about Indiana Jones just kind of artistically before we get into the themes? Well, I mean, you know, what I love it was, it was, those are the first big blockbusters that I can remember. Right. Um, and I didn't, I didn't see like in the theater or anything, right. Mm -hmm. But uh, the first big, big blockbusters I can remember that had all the action, but also had all this, this historical drama, you know, it's really hard to do a period piece. Well, so I mean, you're setting this thing in the thirties and forties, which is already hard to do. To do, to do it well. And they're setting this, you know, like where Indiana Jones is fighting the Nazis for crying out loud. I mean, like it's, it, it gives us historical context. But then they're also going to these ancient lands and dealing with these ancient concepts and relics and icons and, and ancient history and biblical history. And let's be at, okay, most biblical movies or most movies about biblical subjects really stink. Yeah. They're either really cheesy, they're horribly done. The, the costuming is wrong. The, the locations look off. You know what I mean? It's just, it always kind of makes me feel, you know, as a Catholic, as a Christian, I was sort of kind of like, oh gosh, like almost embarrassed. Do you know what I mean? Because you're looking at it going, they didn't have the budget. They didn't have the actors, right? And, and even back then, I mean, to see like, Hollywood put so much budget and so much talent. I mean, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, there weren't two bigger names in all of filmmaking for 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So to have those guys team up, but the, the thing I love most about it is that it still has a sense of humor. Right? Yeah. You still have all the action. You still have all the drama, all the historicity. But the humor, it's, it's the little things. It's the subtle things. And this is, you know, Harrison Ford. I mean, he's coming off of Han Solo fame. I mean, this is what he was like the big – I mean, to be, to be Han Solo and Indiana Jones, I'm not sure there's any actor ever – Who's, who's gotten to portray more, you know, cooler characters. And he just kind of has like that swagger, you know what I mean? When he's in the movie, you look at him and when you're a guy, you're like, I want to be like him. I mean, you know, you're wearing the hat. I honestly, honestly, I remember this. I remember being in a store at like, like 11 years old and I saw a fedora. And I don't think for a little boy, whoever saw those movies, right? Either you know, back then or even like, you know, in retrospect, like on Netflix or something or on, on iTunes. If you see a fedora as a guy, you when you put that fedora on, the first thing you think is Indiana Jones. It yeah. just happens, right? Yeah, it's, I was wishing I had one. Like, I was trying to dress up like Indiana Jones. I think I look more like Crocodile Dundee, but you know, I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Just I mean, Harrison Ford went so on I to just, do. I think, uh, I think what's what's cool is that just the movies have everything, and what's really yeah. really cool is that you don't have to be super into history to like it. Right. If you like action movies, it's there. You like romance, it's there. You like history, it's there. So even when I showed, you know, because like, I showed Raiders, you know, to my own kids, and you know, and they're not necessarily you know huge action fans, but they got really into the story because you want to root for Indiana Jones. He's he's basically taking on the entire Nazi army by himself. It's mm -hmm. great. 
Yeah, and Harrison Ford, he went on to, I forget the character's name, uh, Patriot Games, and there's the new John Krasinski. Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah, that, there's the, the John Krasinski show now. But he, John uh, Harrison Ford was Jack Ryan for, for at least a couple movies, um, and he yeah. was in uh, – the fugitive, the fugitive. Yeah, he was in he was in mm-hmm. so much good stuff so really really like harrison ford um i i love just um i love that he's a modern person who encounters the mis- mystical and kind of as you were saying so many of the the biblical stuff that's done by hollywood either it's um kind of kind of cheesy not that well done or it's kind of like this postmodern take where it's like we're gonna deconstruct and like mm-hmm. moses like the the flood was just actually like the you know it was just like a normal flood and then it got exaggerated you know it's it's stuff like that mm-hmm. um and this was indy as a, kind of a skeptic but mm-hmm. then he encounters these mystical things and there's there's a there's a real journey of faith that that he goes on especially in uh the the third one uh quest for the holy grail so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that but i i really like that and just all the all, all the biblical stuff so but uh, are you ready to get into the themes or anything artistically that yeah. you want to talk about all right so first well, I, first i want to talk about uh the bible so kind of what they call the MacGuffin or like the thing they're going after that kind of pushes the plot um in the first one is the ark of the covenant from the old testament and then in the third mm-hmm. one it's uh the Holy Grail. The second one, it's it's like these Sankara stones out of uh, out of Indian, uh, some sort of Indian either mythology or or, or uh, Hindu, the Hindu religion. And then there's kind of aliens in the fourth one, <laughs> these crystal right. skulls. Right. But I think the ones that are that are the most compelling and generally considered to be the best are the, the first and the third. And certainly for us as Christians, those are the ones that, that mm-hmm. speak to us. So I kind of wanted to talk about, you know, in, in Catholicism, we have a great reverence for kind of these historical sacred objects in a way that a lot of our other Christians and brothers don't like stained glass windows and, and those mm-hmm. sorts of things. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the, the middle ages, they were, there were crusades to, to find relics, you know, relics of the true cross. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they wanted to get some of Mary's milk. I don't know how you would get that, but they were, they were searching right. for all of these things. Mm-hmm. So I kind of wanted to talk about like, why as, as Catholic Christians, do we care about these ancient relics, these, these ancient objects? Uh, is it idolatry? Should we, should we not care about these things? Like, what is it about them? And how does that connect to our spirituality? Well, I think, I think to, right out of the gate, the most important thing is to say, you know, when we hold up something um, iconic, you know, okay, the word iconic has a great meaning nowadays, right? It's, oh, she's iconic. He's iconic. Mm-hmm. But also when you look his, you know, historically, oh, icons are, icons are horrible. Actually, icons are actually wonderful they're, 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 because we are created beings, right? Yeah. And we as a Catholic church, what we say is, hey, you know what? Matter matters. Matter matters. The creator uses creation to point creation back to the creator, right? So that can be in nature. I mean, you can see the way, you know, if you've ever seen the sunset on the on, on Ireland's hills, there's this beautiful red sunset. You ever seen the sun rise on Maui? I mean, you ever, you ever, you know, you ever uh, go into a volcano, you know what I mean? You, I mean, you ever, you ever skydive and you, you ever sit, you know, hold a baby. I mean, looking throughout creation and there are these moments of creation, you see beauty and wonder just blows your mind. It, it says in Romans one, it says, you know, um, that, that, that he created all these things for all of us to see him. And for those who don't see him in it, well, they're hard hearted. You know, basically, this is St. Paul's way of saying to the Romans, God doesn't believe in atheism. OK, like it, it, he, he made it obvious. He made it there. We can all see God. But we as Catholics go, I'd say, say a step further and say, you know what? Not only does matter matters, but when you look at the Gospels, you know what? Jesus, when he heals people, he touches people. You know, mm. he spits and he heals the blind. I mean, he he confects. I mean, he's changing water to wine. I mean, you know, God when he forms when he forms Eve takes a rib and does it. I mean, loaves, fish. I mean, matter matters. That's why we as a church still today, baptisms, confirmations. We got water. We got candles. We got oil. You know, you, you're seeing the blessing of the rings and the binding of the hands. You're seeing like, you know, the, the, the laying on of hands at, at you know, ordination and confirmation. These things matter because they signify in an outward way an interior reality and an interior truth. And that's why as, as a church, we can look at a church and say, you know, it's the stained glass and you see the candles and you see, well, yeah, it's a throwback to the Old Testament with the candles or even the red sanctuary candle, right? That, 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 that flickers next to the tabernacle. That wasn't our idea. That wasn't some pope's idea. That goes all the way back to the time of Moses. That was mm-hmm. that was God's idea that He gave to Moses and Aaron to always have light, to always have a, a lamp, an oil lamp burning outside the what the tent. The word for tent was tabernacle. Yeah. What was inside the tent? Oh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, which is what Indiana goes and looks for, right? But even God Himself. The, sometimes I think we think as Catholics, oh, when it comes to mass, when it comes to worship, that this was just a bunch of popes like you know in some random seventh century like what should we do on sundays we should pretend the bread and wine become jesus that sounds like a good idea and then they just kind of go on and prescribe this but when you actually go back 
scripturally speaking, 3,600 years, that the mass has its roots in Exodus. That for us to fully understand Mary, we can get into this a little bit later, as Thomas Aquinas would say, we have to understand what first? The Ark of the Covenant. Like in the Old Testament, we like to use these big biblical words, prefigurements. Prefigurements are just uh, a coming soon, right? A a summer movie preview, a foreshadowing of Mm -hmm. what God's going to do. God prefigures, he prepares us through the Old Testament, through characters and through situations and through icons. He prepares us for what he's going to do. But when we actually look at the mass, the mass was God's idea. God told us how he wanted us to worship him, and he gave the prescriptions. Much like with the Ark of the Covenant, God says, listen, you're going to take the law, the Ten Commandments. You're going to take a pot of manna, okay, the bread from heaven, and you're going to take the staff of Aaron. And we we learned this in the book of Hebrews. But you're going to take the, 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 the law, the Ten Commandments, the manna, and the, and the staff of Aaron. You're going to put them into an ark. But you're not just going to build any old ark. I'm going to tell you exactly how to build it, the kind of wood to use, the kind of gold to use, how to fashion it, the size of it, the cherubim, on, like the, the angels on top, the poles, everything. He gave it down to, to excruciating detail, if you look at the book of Exodus, mm-hmm. on how the Ark of the Covenant was to be created and handled. And when people handled it improperly, they met their demise. Yeah. But God had an idea and a prescription, and that's what makes this particular icon so fascinating and it blows my mind that it wasn't until what he said 1981 or whatever that anyone really thought to make a major motion picture mm-hmm. out of this because the ark of the covenant in the old Te- old testament speaking was everything for like for a, a third of the old testament that was god's presence on earth yeah mm-hmm. yeah and uh i i love uh you were you were mentioning in, in the old testament uh you know the ark is this is the center of all their worship and then in the new testament uh, you know, Gospel of Luke, the book of Revelation, they all have all these references referring to Mary as the new ark, because if Jesus is the new covenant, if he's the new word, then she is the ark of the new covenant, the bearer of the new covenant. There's in, in the beginning of Luke, there's all these uh, parallels to things in the book of Samuel, mm-hmm. where it uses the same language to describe Mary, like liturgical terms that were used in like the ceremonies for the ark are now used in Mary and in uh, Revelation, oh. Le- Revelation 11 and 12. It's like talking about the ark, and, and then all of a sudden it's talking about Mary. And Boom. so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's it's cool, but that's um, what's so amazing. Like to your to your point, you know, even in the Old Testament, so David is dancing before the ark, right? Mm-hmm. And what do we see happens in the Gospel of Luke? Well, John the Baptist is leaping, but the yeah. same same verb for leaping and dancing is used mm-hmm. before Mary, who's the ark. Who, who does Mary have in her womb? The law, the bread of life, the bread from heaven, mm-hmm. and Aaron, like the, the high priest, Aaron's priestly staff. So it's again, it's all foreshadowed. God was preparing us thousands of years in advance for what was going to happen in Nazareth. Yeah, and I also loved. Um... I, I love that you point out that that's the that's the same the same verb that is used between John the Baptist and David dancing. Um, I love what you talked about uh, icons because I think a lot of times people look at at Catholic worship and they say, oh, it's idolatry, and that's against one of the the Ten Commandments. And of course, idolatry is against one of the commandments. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it talks about in the Psalms, you know, uh, when you're worshiping an idol, you're 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 mistaking the creation for the Creator. Um, mm-hmm. But that. Uh, that happens not just with objects like the ark or with, uh, you know, with people that we idolize, like where, you know, Catholics are often accused of idolizing Mary and making, making her more than Mm -hmm. she's supposed to. Um, But idolization can happen with anything. It can happen with, with the scriptures. It can happen with worship songs. I'm sure you remember from the, from the late nineties, early two thousands, there was that, a worship song. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all (laughs) about you. It's about making worship. Mm -hmm. An idol. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things yeah. I made it. Like we can make any th- any good thing, an idol. And so there's there's these two extremes to avoid. You want to avoid idolatry on the one hand, but then on the, on the other hand, because we are physical creatures, as you said, we need to avoid iconoclasm, and mm-hmm. that's that's the mistake I think. Um, certainly, some of our our, our non Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, probably uh, this is people who are uh, follow Islam, they they make. I think they make that mistake of they they're not as connected physically because i love that um in the catholic church we have these sacraments these you know i when i when i confess my sins to god through the priest i don't just have to take it on faith that i'm forgiven i hear with the words of the priest mm-hmm. you're absolved of your sins and like that makes such a difference like me and my wife we can know that we forgive each other but to actually talk mm-hmm. it out and to speak it that makes a difference right like there's a and reason we about- have a, a wedding ceremony where we're actually saying I commit myself to you, well, you know, but not just the wedding ceremony, 
the wedding bands, mm -hmm. the wedding photos, right? So, the wedding so night. Why, do you, why do you put, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so why do you put a wedding photo on the wall? Are you worshiping the, the glass and the wood and the, and the, and the photo print? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, the same way, you know, Hey, you, you, on the phone, like I have a picture of my wife on my phone. Like wh why do we do these things? Because yeah. it's a visual representation. It's an exterior representation of an interior posture or an interior focus or an interior priority. Right. So when we're, when I'm, if I'm kneeling before a statue of our lady in the Catholic church, I'm not worshiping the plaster of the wood, but it's helping me. And I'm like ADHD. I mean, I'm so easily distracted. It's helping me to visualize and internalize much like Mary did in the scriptures of pounding these things in her heart. What does a rosary do? I'm not worshiping beads, but it's helping me to internalize these sacred mysteries. Yes. And that's one of the things that's so fascinating about Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Jones of the Last Crusade. Cause like you said earlier in the show, he is a logical professor, right? He yeah. says he's searching for, he's searching for facts. So he is, he's hardwired skeptically to look at all these quote unquote religious, you know, historical things. And what's fascinating is the evolution of mind for him as he comes face to face with the reality of the ark, as he sees face to face the, the mystical come into reality. And what, what was what was seen as this fanciful, you know, uh, fictional biblical story unfold before his eyes. And he starts to see that the power of God and the power of the, well, really the power of God as, as, found in the ark is beyond human understanding. And that's why like, um, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about fides quare infant electum, like faith seeking understanding is that we as Catholics can say, this is a mystery and it's okay. You see that the, the modern world wants to try and take every mystery and solve it away, explain it away and just dismiss it. And what we say as a church is the mass, for instance, or the faith or something like the Ark of the Covenant is not a mystery to be solved. It's a mystery to behold. Mm. And we, as the as the players, you know, as the as the characters in God's story, He gives us these gifts, these moments. Whether it's something as iconic as the Ark of the Covenant or a Marian apparition, He gives us these moments that allow us to suspend disbelief, to suspend logic, and to be able to say, "Hold on, faith and reason have to work hand in hand. Faith and reason are two wings of the same dove, but they have to work hand in hand to ascend for the dove to fly." Mm -hmm. And that's why it's such a gift when God gives us these moments, it's the same thing Jesus did for Thomas in the upper room after the resurrection, right? I'm going to give you moments. I'm going to give you opportunities to enter into something, the road to Emmaus. I'm going to give you opportunities to enter into something that, that, that goes far beyond what your human logical brain can fathom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing that I really appreciate about, you know, relics like the, like the Ark or any of the relics that, that we, we venerate as, as Catholics is I love that there is, it grounds our belief in history and that there's a real history to it. As you said, like faith seeking understanding and, uh, you know, John Paul II, our Pope two popes ago, wrote the great encyclical faith and reason fetus et ratio that mm -hmm. it's not, we don't just take it on faith. We do take it on faith. Sometimes you hit this mystery um, that, that we can never understand completely. You know, it's like math. You can figure out a lot and you mm -hmm. can do calculus, but we'll never know everything about math because math, math is infinite and God is infinite. So we'll never completely, you know, delve, delve that mystery. Um, and so there is a certain faith to it that an encounter with God, a relationship with God, a call, and then we, we're, we respond. It's a gift that we respond to. But then there also is this grounded in history that we can go and look at the scriptures and compare them to other historical documents and see that like, you know, there's references to vegetation, which is accurate. Like the names of the people that are used are accurate with what we find when, when we look at other ancient documents for what were names in that region at the time. There's all these sort of historical consistencies that you find when you do an analysis of the scriptures that aren't there when you read I, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but some some texts that claim to be historical from some other religions, uh, that historicity just isn't there. And so that's one thing I love about uh, Catholicism is we have the faith and the reason, and there really is a historicity um, to it. And that's actually one of the things I wanted to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about the real history of the Ark and the Grail, mm -hmm. as opposed to what we find. Um, was there anything that just stood out to you as like, ah, that's not quite right when you were when you were looking at the watching the movies? You know, I mean, 
I mean, there, there's obviously obviously gonna be a, you know dramatic license for Hollywood, yeah. you know. So yeah. what you know in the in the first one in Raiders and spoiler alert, you know, if you yeah. haven't seen the last spoiler is a movie from forty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's uh, it, it's some of the histories when they're when they're looking through the books and saying, oh look, see this is what is this? That's so the power of God, and they're showing a, a, an illustration of what it looked like, and you know th- that really those don't really. Um, exist in that way. No, you know, what we have, what we know about the power of the Ark of the Covenant really does just come from sacred scripture, not really necessarily from oral tradition back then. Uh, but what I really took, what I really loved was how closely they followed scripture when it came to the design of the Ark and yes. the look of the Ark. Mm-hmm. If you were to, if you were to flip through Exodus, and this is where you would go. I mean, um, usually in Exodus, we stop reading about Exodus chapter 20, if we're reading it at all. We'll make it through the plagues. We'll make it through, you know, Moses and the plagues and then the, the, the Red Sea and um, you know um, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and you know the Golden Calf, and then we sort of stop. Mm-hmm. But really, the, the, where, where Exodus gets really, if you get geeky and historical, it gets really fascinating is after that, because this is where God gives us prescription for worship, and God's like, hey, you know, there should be a there should be a, a lamp stands and a table for bread, and there should be you know candles, there should be priestly vestments. You start to go, oh my gosh, like this is like a rule book, a handbook for the Catholic Mass, just mm-hmm. 3, 3,500 years ago. Let's get into it. But one of the things that was fascinating was it talks about, you know, fashion the golden cherubim atop the ark, you know, and, and to have like the, the poles go through the sides with the rings. When you watch the movie, I was so fascinated by how seriously George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, who were raised Jewish, um, how seriously and, and specific they were to the details of scripture. Because when you watch other biblical movies that are really good, like I loved Prince of Egypt. It was a great, really, really well-made movie from DreamWorks, right, 30 years ago. But they took a lot of dramatic license. I mean, a lot of dramatic license and to make it more, you know, Hollywood suitable, child friendly, that kind of a thing. Raiders really didn't do that. I mean, they speculate what it would look like when, when, the, when the lid comes off the ark and that sort of a thing. It, it took a, it had a, it was a little too um, ghostly, you know, yeah. for me, it's a little too, you know, ghouls flying out of it and that kind of a thing. But I think at the heart of it, though, the representation of this is an incomparable, uncontrollable power that is in human hands you can't be messing with you know and and what what i love is it ultimately in the film it's the humility both in the in raiders and also in last crusade mm-hmm. what we see is it, it, when when the road diverges into the wood and and you have you know indiana has to either suspend logical disbelief and suspend you know quote unquote facts and logic and enter into the mystery and into the mystical and when he does his humility is what carries him through it's his penitence it's his awareness of his own unworthiness in the presence of what he might at the time say, I, I, someone I can't explain or understand, but really the presence of God, you know, and it, it's, it's a timeless reminder for all of us that, you know, when you come, when you come face to face with God, whether that's in the confessional, it's in the sanctuary, it's an adoration, mm-hmm. you know, when you come face to face with God in his word, really, it's a sacramental. When you do this, you have two options, right? You can either be prideful and puff your chest, which is not going to end well, which is what happens with the Nazis, right? Yeah. Or you can fall on your knees before the God of the universe and say, there is a God and it's not me. And only when you do the latter do we really unlock true wisdom and true virtue is when we actually come face to face with this, these two realities. There is a God and it's not me. Yeah. And that really is the essence of Raiders of the Lost Ark and also Last Crusade. Yeah. It's, it's not just a quest for, for truth. It's a quest. It's an interior quest to find like your true self, you know, and 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 answer those bigger questions of is there a God and why am I here and 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 watching just watching each character have to have to come to grips with their own personal doubts and their own personal struggles and these own realities. It's it's really a that the stories are great metaphors for life because I, you can find yeah. yourself in one of the characters in every movie. Absolutely. I love what you said. There's that choice between humility. Am I going to humble myself before God? Is it going to be my way? I was, uh, I reread the great divorce by CS Lewis recently. And mm. there's this great line in there where it says uh, in the end, uh, we either, we say to God, God, thy will be done. Or God will say to us, fine, thy will be done. And God lets us go our own way. And that's that's what hell is. That's what hell is. Right. And, and uh Kasim, who's the guy like that in the in the Holy Grail who like defends, like he's part of the order that defends the Holy Grail. Um, mm-hmm. he says, For the unrighteous, the cup of Christ holds everlasting damnation. Um, and mm-hmm. I mean that sounds really harsh, but what is damnation? If you look in the catechism, I don't have the paragraph off the top of my head, but the catechism says that what hell is, is it's this self-chosen separation from God. When we have rejected God's mercy, when we have said to God, no, I want it my way, 
not your way. God ultimately lets us have that choice. He doesn't force himself on us. And so um, we see all these people, uh, like the Nazis, they're trying to manipulate the 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 ark. They're trying to manipulate the grail and use it for selfish things. And they end up drinking judgment on themselves, as, as Paul says mm-hmm. in First Corinthians. Um, and at the, I love there's this sequence at the end of uh, the quest for the Holy Grail. Um, it's almost like the 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 one ring in Lord of the Rings. Like it starts corrupting mm-hmm. people. It, it corrupts. Uh, I forget the girl's name. Um, the, uh, the the blonde Nazi. the blonde girl. I forget her <laughs> name. Uh, Elsa. Elsa is her name. Elsa. Um, sure. You know, and she she ends up falling down a pit because she's going after the Grail. And then mm-hmm. Indy is like hanging on the edge, trying to get. And he's like, I can reach it, Dad. I can reach it. And then his dad finally, in this moment where they're finally connecting, says, "Indiana, let it go." And he mm-hmm. lets the Grail go. He turns back to his dad and. Mm-hmm. Like that's such a moment of 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 faith where it's it's not about my glory. It's not about whether can I get this in a museum and be a big famous archaeologist or can I keep this from the Nazis. Ultimately, like the glory of God is something to submit yourself to, not something to like manipulate and control right. for your own. But, your own pride, but again, so. yeah. But you, but you have Indiana, right? Who's who's at that crossroad, and this is going to bring him glory. It's going to bring him fame. It's a culmination of this great quest. And what is it? It's the voice of the Father. That calls him back out of the worldly into the eternal, right? So yes. your worth, like 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 my love for you, your life is here. It's not there, and it's it's like you said, it's it's that it's it's Jesus in the desert with 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 Satan in his ear. It's you know, do you want all the riches of the world? Like I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, and you, and you're looking at it saying like the world is. And this, this is the same thing from the Garden of Eden, right? Yes. So it's shiny. It doesn't say that apple's bad. It doesn't say the fruit's bad. It says it looks good, actually. It's, it's, it's good. It's enticing. It's shiny. It's great. So it wasn't like Adam and Eve were idiots. I mean, but the, the, the allure of the created, they let go of the creator. And yes. that, that really is the ultimately, isn't that, that's, every, that's all of our challenge. Sin is just the allure of the created, right? Yeah. It, it, that takes us, our eyes off of and distracts us from the creator. There's, I have a couple other quotes here from Last Crusade. Uh, well, for, first of all, throughout like all three movies, Indy constantly uses the phrase mumbo jumbo when he's talking mm-hmm. about like things that are mythical and 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 spiritual. He says, ah, I don't believe all that mumbo jumbo or whatever. He kind of looks down at it, down his nose at it. Um, but there's a few moments in Last Crusade where uh, he says, uh, oh, Kasim asks him, ask yourself why you seek the cup of Christ. Is it for his glory or for yours? And I, I love that that line. And then later when he's talking at the end, when he's talking to his dad, uh, he, his dad, Henry Jones says, Elsa never really believed in the grail. She thought she'd found a prize. And Indy says, what did you find, dad? He says, illumination. What did you find, Junior? And then they argue about his name, whether it's a junior or Indiana. Mm-hmm. But um, just, I, I think there's... <laughs> There's there's a real beauty and he comes to faith, especially at the end when his dad gets shot and then he has to go through the three trials. And mm-hmm. there's this um the the first one he has to uh like uh the, the penitent man will pass. He has to like kneel before right. God or he gets his head shut off, and then there's like right. the, he has to spell out the name of God, um, and then mm-hmm. he has to take like the leap of faith. And all, all three of those I think you could you could delve into and there's like deep lessons there. They again they they kind of make it very concrete and adventure worthy for going through a temple in the movie. But I think I think there's right. there's deeper lessons to be learned there. Um but even but even even to the point you had, you know, whose glory is it you seek, you know, um God's or your own. Mm-hmm. Isn't that the question that every one of us have to answer still today in the 21st century? Ooh. It doesn't matter what, what industry you're in, what job you have, social media, who are you in it for? Are you in it for God's glory or your own? You can always tell, you can always tell on the like look in someone's face if they wake up counting their problems or their blessings. Mm. You can always tell about someone, some of social media if they're seeking God's glory or their own, you know? And social media can be great. I mean, I, I love social media, I love social media. But but let's not forget that that the devil can use anything good and twist it for bad, right? So we have to understand, especially as Catholic Christians. I mean, Mike, you have a platform. I mean, you you go around like you know, you speak, you lead worship, you know, you're online, you, you have a you're online ministry. So you, um, as much as anybody else, are aware. You know, the spiritual attack is always there. First Peter yeah. says the devil is constantly searching you like a prowling lion. Mm-hmm. It says in Romans seven twenty one. It says I have to realize the premise that when I seek to do good, evil will be at hand. So this requires all of us to check ourselves. And that's a great reminder from the movie. When, you know, when you're seeking the cup of Christ, what is a cup of Christ for, for any of us? It could be fame. It could be glory. It could be attention. It could be affirmation, right? So like anything, we all have to check ourselves daily, constantly. That's why the penitent man falling on his knee is so important. That's why going to adoration, going to confession, getting to mass, falling on our knees constantly before the God of the universe is so important. That's why daily prayer, that morning offering, that nightly examine is so important. 
Because if we're not, we can so easily and subtly be seduced yes. into seeking our own glory. And that really is in, in, in a microcosm, that lesson from Last Crusade that Hasim says is so important for all of us, especially those of us who proclaim to be Catholic Christian or have a platform in the modern world, because it is so seductive. Yeah. And if we're going to seek to do any kind of good, evil is going to be at hand. We are going to have a target on ourselves. And those words should be resonating in our soul. Whose glory is it that you seek? And we, we can look for, throughout the lives of the saints, look throughout scripture. Those who seek the glory of God, we now call saints. We herald, right? But, but those who seek their own glory, they, they meet their demise. And it's, it's one of those, it's, it's the perfect spiritual analogy set in an action scene. Yes. Yes, yes. It makes me think of uh, St. Ignatius Loyola. His his motto was Ad Majorum Dei Gloriam. It's the motto of the Jesuits, AMDG, which means for the greater glory of God. And if you've ever done any of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, mm -hmm. the, for the, the prelude to each exercise, the prelude to each prayer is that this prayer, everything I'm doing may be for God's glory and the salvation of my soul. And so mm -hmm. I, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. And you're speaking to my heart right now that it's, it's so tempting when I, you know, I put out an episode, is anybody going to like this? How many likes am I going to get? How many followers are gonna, am I going to have? How, is anybody going to come up to me after this talk and say what a good job I did? Or after mm -hmm. I do music at mass, is anybody going to say how, how good I did? And for me, it's be, it's become a spiritual discipline of before and after I do any sort of ministry is mm -hmm. this is for God's glory. And I'm, I'm I always say this to young adults. Vessel. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, you know, young, young adults, like if, if I'm ever meets my like, Hey, will you follow me on social media? I'll say, why? Like, and not, not to be, not to be like a jerk, just like, why? Like, why do you want me to follow you? Like, is it because you want to increase your number of followers mm -hmm. or is it because you want to lead me to Jesus? You know what I mean? And I mean, you know, Hitler had millions of followers. Jesus had 12. Okay. At the end of the day, Ooh. like, it, like we all have to look at ourselves and go, Hey, um, it's not about the numbers. It's not about being an influencer. It's not about being YouTube famous. It's about, you know, and honestly, if everybody likes you, you're probably not preaching the gospel, yeah. to be honest, mm -hmm. you know, like, like earth applauds, um, what, what, what heaven shakes their head at and heaven applauds what earth crucifies. Mm. So at the end of the day, if you and I can wake up and pray against the desire to see fruit, right? Just rejoice in the fact that God called you in the vineyard, rejoice in the fact he called you to till the soil. Rejoice in the fact that he, he, he invited you to, to share, you know, and, and cast seed, but pray against the desire to see fruit. Now, if he decides to let you see fruit, wants to throw you a bone, hey, awesome, take it all day long, man. It's great. Mm -hmm. But pray against the desire to, because I'm the same as you, Mike, because you commit, because when you come off a stage and you're like, you know, you're looking for that validation, that affirmation, yeah. devil got you. You know, it has to be, I'm going to go yes. preach what the spirit says to preach. Let the, let the, let the seed follow where it may. I can't control it. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, all that matters is I can stand or more to the point, kneel before God like Indiana does yes. and know that I'm a beloved son, no matter what I did or didn't do. Amen. Woo. I love it. I love, I love it. What you said, like Hitler had millions of followers. Jesus had 12. Man, that's that, that, that needs to that, that, you can tweet that mm. tattoo that. That's a good line. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, what I want to spend our last section of here on is I want to talk about you work with youth. I work huh? with youth. Um, Indiana Jones. There's a lot of youth. There's there's Marion in the in the in the first movie, uh, who was is like twenty something when we meet her. But when Indy first met her, she was like in her teens. And there's and uh, mm -hmm. then there's short round in the second movie, uh, and then in the fourth movie, there's uh, the Shia LaBeouf. Mutt, Mutt is his name. So I think mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about those in the in the patron exclusive content for my patrons. So patrons, check that out sure. in the Awaken Act after this. But what I want to talk about with you, Mark, is. Um, I want to talk about Indy's relationship with his father. And uh, mm. there's a couple quotes from Last Crusade I want to talk about here. Where when in the in the opening scene, he's being like chased by these guys that he's stolen this this like cross of Coronado from, and he's like right. trying to take it to a museum. And he's like, Dad, dad, and his dad's working on his grail diary. Um, mm -hmm. and his dad kind of blows him off. And so he's talking about it later. They're on the blimp and they're he's trying they're trying to talk about their fa fatherhood and uh Indy says, it was just the two of us, dad. It was a lonely way to grow up for you too. If you'd been an ordinary average father, like the other guys, dads, so you'd have understood that. And, uh, Henry says, actually, I was a wonderful father. And Indiana Jones says, when did I ever tell you to eat up, go to bed, wash your ears, do your homework? No, I respected your privacy and I taught you self-reliance. And Indy says, what you taught me was that I was less important to you than people who had been dead for 500 years in another country. And I learned it so well that we've hardly spoken for 20 years. 
And then Henry says, you left just when you were becoming interesting. <laughs> right. He says, what do you want to talk about? And Indy says, I can't think of anything. He says, then what are you complaining about? We have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the best that's one of the best scenes oh, yeah so it's good. like so funny but like so crippling it's like what i learned was that i was less important to you than people mm -hmm. that lived 500 years ago in another country and i never can mm -hmm. we haven't talked in 20 years because of that so but is it isn't this the same though so you know like mike said like we were a lot of young people you know obviously um there's there's a lot of there's a lot of pain that can exist uh in a, in a home of a teenager college student you know like just growing up we, we all have wounds right um, we people thought that the father ruined a lot, right? I mean, if the dad's not around, you know, maybe he's just, maybe he doesn't live there or maybe he's just you know, working. I'll talk to teens all the time. And, um, you know, and this is pre COVID. This isn't even just because of the pandemic. Um, and when I talk to teens, you know, most, most prevalent isn't so much, Oh, my mom and dad are divorced or, you know, maybe that's the case, but it's, it's always the thing they hear most of the teens is my mom and dad don't care. My mom and dad are too busy. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad are too stressed. Um, it's almost like, you know, like, like, like our parents, they could be physically present in the home, a lot of parents are just right here all the time. They're constantly looking at their phone. That really is the essence of what Indiana's saying to his dad. What he's saying was like, you know, hey, you were physically present, but you weren't emotionally present. And I'll speak for myself. You know, my father got rest his soul. He was a, a wonderful man, raised six kids. Um, you know, um, hardworking man. You know, I mean, he was gone before most of us got up, got home. You know, after some of us were already in bed, and he worked that way for years. Um, and I never doubted that he loved me. And when it came to providing, there was always food on the table. There was always a roof over our heads, you know, and, uh, and he was, and he was um, a stern kind of disciplinarian, but he just wasn't present because he was like a workaholic. Right. So it wasn't until he retired in his later years that I really came to know him as a person and came to like understand why he worked so hard and that, you know, it was hard for him to communicate in that way. So I really, I resonated with Indiana and in that character, right. Having this, this like obsessive father who maybe had a hard time being um, emotionally available, you know, and affirming. I think a lot of people can, 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 uh, that resonates with a lot of people, right. That, that, yeah. that concept of that kind of earthly father, right. The provider type, the harsh type, but what I'll say, and, and this is why I love scripture. I think, you know, when I was 16, I started reading scripture. Uh, I, I started my life team started my parish. My youth minister taught me how, how to start reading scripture, started reading. And when I came, what I came to was not this bloodthirsty, horrible God of the Old Testament who wanted to smite people. What I came face to face to was uh, was with this God who loved me for me. Yes. You know, that it, to, to go page after page and, and character after character and see a God who is constantly wanting to be in relationship with his people and making himself available to his people and affirming them with his presence. If I said to you, what's the highest affirmation God could give you? You know, well, the fact that I'm here. Okay, beyond that. What's the highest affirmation he could give you? Follow me on it's social not, media. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> the highest affirmation he could give you, right? The highest affirmation this side of heaven is the Eucharist. Mm. Because God doesn't just say, I want to dwell before you. God looks at you and all your sin and all your unworthiness and says, I want to dwell within you. Ooh. So take take care of your stuff. Go take care of your unrequited sin, okay, your un, un, unconfessed sin. Get in a state of grace. But I, I don't just want to dwell outside of you like an ark in the tent. I want to dwell inside of you. I want to make you the tent. I want to make you the tabernacle. So we have a God, you know, who looks through unworthiness and declares our worth. Mike, we have a God who loves us so much that he would rather die than risk spending eternity without us. Mm. That's the highest affirmation there is. The Eucharist is the highest affirmation there is. And that's why what Indiana's seeking in the last crusade, what he's ultimately was seeking from his dad was the emotional presence. Because that is what was going to validate his sonship and him as a son. And what we have in the Eucharist is God's divine, eternal presence par excellence so that God is saying to us, you never have to be without me. You never have to go without knowing me. And this was so interesting. So Jeremiah is the one who, you know, supposedly, you know, was the last to see the ark, right, yep. in the Old mm -hmm. Testament. Jeremiah later on in his letter in, uh, in chapters 30 and 31, he gives us a prophecy 800 years before Jesus. And in his prophecy says, God says through Jeremiah, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Not like the one when I took you out of Egypt, when I led you by the hand because they were hard hearted and I had to show myself their master. Cause what God carved his law on, on the stone. He says, no, no, no. In this new covenant, he says, I'm going to place my law within you and I'm going to write it on the, on your hearts of flesh. And you're not going to have to explain how to know me anymore. All from the least to the greatest are going to know me. So he gives this prophecy of the Eucharist 
literally centuries before Jesus is even born. He gives it through Jeremiah, who is really the, the, the gatekeeper, the guardian of the Ark of the Covenant and the Old Covenant. But he's saying through this guardian of the Old Covenant, I'm going to make a new covenant. It's yeah. just, it's, it's fascinating because God, this was his plan from the beginning. The Eucharist wasn't just an idea Jesus had one night in an upper room. It was God's idea from the very, very beginning. The same way that, that what we ate brought us damnation in, in, a, in a garden. I mean, literally, it's going to be by what we eat that's going to bring us salvation in the Eucharist. Yes. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's fascinating. Um, so so much good stuff uh, that that you said there. Um, it, readers or listeners, if you want to read more about Jeremiah and the Ark of the Covenant, you can go to Second Maccabees chapter two, and that's where it talk about Jeremiah fleeing from the Babylonians who are about to burn down Jerusalem and hiding it, and that it will be revealed at some time in the future. Um, so if you want to read about that, but that that passage, Jeremiah is my favorite prophet in the Old Testament. Whenever people oh, yeah. say they want to read the Old Testament, I say start with the Psalms, and after that, go to Jeremiah. That's that's what I say. Um, I, I love that passage about it giving us a new. Um, a new law that will be written on our hearts. It pairs very well with uh, Ezekiel when it says, I'm going to take your hearts of stone and give you a hearts of flesh and all those resurrection uh, images in the book of Ezekiel. So I, I, I love those. Um, there is, uh, oh, there, there's a, what, what you were talking about with God just loving us so much that he doesn't want just to be before us, but within us is mm-hmm. it makes me think of the prodigal son. And mm-hmm. so often we think in our sin that, you know, God's going to be this angry God, this angry God, this angry God. But, but just like you were saying, like when I read the scriptures, what, are, what is the old Testament, old Testament supposed to be this angry God, but what does it say about God? He is slow to anger and abounding in kindness. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, the, that I, I really think of the prodigal son, because what does the, the father do when the prodigal son comes home? He just welcomes him home and throws a celebration. And there's a, there's a prodigal son moment in this movie, which I think is the turning point for Indy and Henry finally, like recognizing their love for each other is the moment when uh, Indy goes off the cliff in the tank and Mm -hmm. uh, he manages to get out, but Henry thinks he's dead and he turns around and it's kind of a funny moment because they're all looking over like, Oh my gosh. And then he just walks (laughs) behind him like all covered in dust and Henry turns around and embraces him. He says, I thought I'd lost you boy. I thought I'd lost you boy. And, And like, that is such an image to me of, like coming back to God, like anytime I've done something bad, anytime I've done something hurtful, like going to confession, coming back to God, like that, I thought I'd lost you, boy. Like that is like, that is the voice of God to me and, and to so many people I know who have been doing things that were harmful for them, harmful for other people. So uh, listeners, if you're listening and if you're in a place where you are far from God right now, like you can go back to church. You can go back to confession. You can come back to God. You can open your Bible right now. You can, and just hear the voice of God, the father who loves you so much. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd lost you and feel that embrace. Like God just wants to welcome you back so badly. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that man, Indiana Jones hitting you right in the feels. (laughs) See, but this is, this is, but this is why it's such good storytelling and why it's such good writing and why it's so superbly acted Mm -hmm. because 40 years later, 30 years later, we're still talking about these movies, yeah. You know, and that, that's why it's like, you know, nowadays when you if if you open up iTunes, you know, or your Apple TV, whatever, and you see when you see I don't know about you, Mike, when you see all the movie posters, do you see the darkness in all of them? I mean, yeah. like like just the imagery, the storytelling. There's just so much darkness, right? And so many of them are so poorly written and horrifically acted. So much of the the dribble that's coming out nowadays. So sometimes it, it is. It, it makes more sense. That's why I love this whole this whole concept of pop culture catechism. It makes sense to go back, go back to some of the the classics, because the classics never go out of style. Mm-hmm. They they just never do. Good writing never goes out of style. Mm-hmm. Um, deeper themes and plots they never go out of style. And if you're willing to to, to put on the, the, a lens and say, Kierkegaard used to Kierkegaard said about scripture, scripture speaks to me, and scripture speaks about me. And good filmmaking is going to speak to you, but more to the point, it's going to speak about you. Mm. So when you're watching the movie, you don't like you don't just say, "What is this telling me about the Ark of the Covenant or about God's presence among His people?" But then when you watch these characters, you go, "What is this saying about me, Indiana? Well, how am I like Indiana? What's this saying about me, Marion? How am I like her? Like, what is this saying about me?" The more sometimes, sometimes it's easier to do this with film or television than it is with scripture. But scripture is the same exact way. You can find yourself in scripture, right? But if, if sometimes it's easier when you watch a, a, a movie to go, I resonate with this character, but I have to ask myself why. The minute I start to ask myself why, now I grow in self-awareness. Now, the next time I open my Bible and I'm reading, whether it could be, be the fall of Genesis, right? It's not just Adam and Eve, 
I'm the one sitting there with fruit juice running down my face. I'm the one who chooses myself, right? Yeah. The minute I look at Moses and go, hey, you know, look, I, I'll, you, you, anyone who's a leader out there, especially if you're a leader in ministry, you know, youth, youth leader, adult ministry, worship leader, if you think just because you're up front and you got a microphone that you're good to go, you better yeah. go read about Moses again. Yeah. Moses, he, he might have led a million people out of slavery. The brother tapped the rock twice. He didn't see the promised land. Mm-hmm. Okay, so at the end of the day, it's not about all you've done for God. It's who you are before God. I mean, yeah. there are all these lessons we can learn from all these different characters in Scripture, and they're timeless. We just have to be able to put on that lens. And sometimes doing it in a movie and finding, finding out how to do that in a movie with those characters is easier than it is in Scripture. But it's a great exercise on how to be able to go deeper in the Bible. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 So we, we've talked a lot about a lot here, Mark. I, I told my listeners that. When we were done with this, we were going to try to leave them with some some simple, apl- applicable things where they could incorporate the gospel into their life today when they unplug. And so, if you if there's just one thing that's stuck from you from this conversation, I'll, I'll give I can go first if you want, or you can go. We'll, we'll each give a little gospel takeaway. So for me, I think it's really that what you were talking about that God doesn't just want to be for us. He wants to be within us and that God is, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant to communicate with God. We don't need, we, we can, God is right here with us and he's given us tools. He's given us sacraments. He's given us the scripture. He's given us the church. He's given us prayer within ourselves at any moment, any given moment, we can return back to God and he's there to embrace us and say, oh, I was just, I was just afraid that I lost you, but I'm, I'm back. So the next time I'm, I'm feeling distant from God, I'm going to try to remember that moment and just feel the father embracing me. So that's my gospel takeaway. That's really good. Um, I would say we are all uh, in search of something and we're all on a quest for something. Ultimately, what we're all searching for is, is true love, sincere love, authentic love, not a love of uh, for what we do or how we look, but for who we are. And ultimately, that's what everybody's looking for. So even when someone's, oh, I want to be rich. No, no, you want you want to feel love. No, I I, I want to be in a relationship. Yeah, because you want to feel love. Well, I want to be thinner because you want to feel love. I want more followers because you want to feel love. At the end of the day, the answer to every question is because you want to feel love. And and God is love. The problem is that we are so short sighted and so easily distracted that, like Elsa in Last Crusade, we choose we choose the shiny object rather than the simple object. Right? Mm-hmm. We choose the shiny distraction of the world, the allure of social media fame, the promise of a relationship, you know, pornography, which everybody shoots all the shiny stuff uh, because it, because we think it's going to fulfill us and we think it's going to make us feel loved. But that love is false and it's fleeting. And to find true joy and true love and true peace, you can only find those in God. We are hardwired for God and God is going to use everything in his power and in creation to try to point us back to him. The problem is we get distracted along the way. So if that's where anyone watching this is at, that's okay. It make you horrible. It makes you human. Yes. But fall on your knees before God and just say, God, I, I want to know you in my life. I, I want you in my life. Well, God, please reveal your, yourself to me. You know, Get back to confession, whatever you got to do. But, but whatever you have to do, recognize and realize that everyone is searching for the same thing. The, the happy people, the joyful people, the peaceful people are the ones who know who the answer is and just do everything they can to try to stay connected to them. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. So but in a moment, I'll, I'll ask you to close this in prayer, if that's all right, Mark. Yeah. Um, but, but before I need to ask you, what's your favorite Indiana Jones movie? Somebody's never Last watched Crusade. before. What's wait, Last, For Crusade. Sure. Last I think Crusade. that's my favorite. Right? But, yeah, but yeah. I'll say, but to really appreciate Last Crusade, you have to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to appreciate Last Crusade. You know, it's very, very seldom that that any sequel is better than the original. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like Last Crusade. That's good, not just because it's superbly acted or written, but it really, um, it, it it really does advance the characters even more that have already been established. So yeah, that's definitely my favorite. One hundred percent agree. I I think uh, Last Crusade is my favorite. Then then uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, then Temple, Temple, of, of Temple of Doom, then 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 Crystal Skull. Then Although, Crystal Skull. I, like I like I said, on a second viewing, Crystal Skull was not as bad as I thought it was the first time. There's still some interesting dynamics. So, I like um, that they, I like that yeah. Crystal Skull tap, it tips the fedora 
to the original three yeah. in several places. I like that. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see what number five has for us next summer. We'll have to be a little patient for that. All right. So uh, we talked about our gospel challenges and our, our gospel takeaways. Listeners, we would love to hear what your gospel takeaway was. You can throw those in the comments on uh, YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're watching this or listening to it. And uh, Mark, would you please close us in prayer and listeners, Happy wherever you are, take a moment. Let's pray together. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, thank you for the gift of this time. I thank you for the God, God for the gift of this ministry and this mission. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to see you in unexpected places, to see your presence, to see and experience your love, your mercy. Lord, open our eyes to your truth. Lord, we ask that you would, you would uh, bless and watch over all those who have watched and listened to this that you cover them with your sacred blood, that you defend them from the slings and the arrows of the evil one, that you would help them to know you and to share your presence with those in their lives, their homes, their schools, their jobs, their world. And especially this day, Mother Mary, Ark of the Covenant, St. Joseph, we ask that you pray with us and pray for us that we would behold the face of your son in all we encounter, both those who are easy to love and those who are not. Lord, we ask that you grant us life until our work is over and work until our life is done. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to have this conversation. I knew, I knew you were the right person to talk about this with. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for being here and sharing your, your Bible geek wisdom with us and your youth ministry uh, wisdom with us and just uh, your ministry as somebody who's, who's trying, to, trying to walk the walk, the walk and talk the talk. Um, if, people wanna, if people do want to follow you, not for selfish reasons, but for the glory of God, because you're going to lead them to Jesus, where, where should they look? Uh, you just look up Bible Geek. Look, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook if you're still there. Um, <laughs> you can go to BibleGeek.com. Uh, you can go to LifeTeen.com. I'm all over the place. Just, Great. just yeah, just type it in. <laughs> awesome. I am Mike Tenney. You can find me at popculturecatechism.com and Mike Tenney Music. Uh, listeners, thank you so much for being with us today. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode. And I'm going to ask you to do uh, two things. First of all, if you liked this episode, don't follow me. Rather, what you should do is send it to somebody who you think would appreciate it. Who needs to hear this message that you know? Send them in a text, send them an email, share the link with them um, that you think would appreciate this message. And the second thing, if you want more of this content, uh, you can go to popculturecatechism.com and become a patron of the show. There's six tiers that you can choose from, a uh, different financial contribution each month. And with that, you get exclusive content for each episode. So for example, after this episode, uh, I'm going to talk about Indy's relationship with women, uh, specifically with men. Marian and how that's a little bit sketchy. I'm going to talk about his relationship with Short Round uh, and with Mutt and that father-son relationship. So if you're interested in that, uh, become a patron and check it out. Also, all the talks I give in my speaking ministry, I record and they uh, go in. Uh, that's available for patrons as well. And there's a bunch of other perks you can check out at popculturecatechism.com. So to support the show and get even more Pop Culture Catechism, uh, become a patron, please. Also, I want to tell you about the Awaken app. All the shows by Awake that are run by Awaken Catholic, like this one, um, you can access through the Awaken app. It's kind of a hub for all of our shows, but it's also a, a kind of a great Catholic Christian alternative to some of the more toxic social media that's out there. And there's a Catholic uh, prayer library and music library. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. Uh, we run promotions all the time for Lent and different liturgical seasons, and it's free for everyone. And then if you are a patron of one of the shows, uh, you get premium content as well. So thank you so much. Really appreciate you being with us, and we'll see you next time.